I'm Julie Cielo, the founder of Firm Fatale and the inventor of the probiotic mocktail. So what is a probiotic mocktail? Well, there are specific criteria. Here at Firm Fatale, we like to call it drinking dirty. So to drink dirty is to consume good bacteria, yeast, enzymes, and naturally occurring vital nutrients formed during the wild fermentation process. Fermentation has always been a superior way of preserving food and nourishing a disease-free family. It's time to get back to our roots. Fern Fatal produces and inspires an artisanal homesteader lifestyle, even in an urban environment. So revising community vibes to align with the cycles of nature is what Fern Fatal is all about. Fermentation in itself is a miraculous biochemical transformation when organic matter is introduced to the right environments. And those may be watery, yeasty, dark, fungal. In this context, wild matter rots before it organically transforms into new life. The process is figuratively like watching death and awaiting a rebirth. So fermentation allows this organic matter to become even more bioavailable, more probiotic in the individual ingredients than they were to begin with. So there's a big difference between taking a synthetic pill that's generated in a lab and nourishing your body with wildly fermented foods symbiotically produced with naturally occurring compounds. Fermented foods have been consumed for centuries throughout the world. At one time, fermenters were considered magical, mystical, and mysterious parts of society in certain cultures. But when the process befell the scope of scientific examination and methodology, it took the sexy out of it. So here at Firm Vital, we aim to bring uh, this approach to drinking dirty both in its process and its philosophy about living in the moment, embracing imperfection as a pathway to growth. So drinking dirty is the way to improve the gut, the skin, and the immune system by putting live soldiers of peace into your body to fight against the countless pathogens trying to invade your body. So with over 20 years of experience as a medium, a mortician, and a healer, I aim to not just teach you about these key principles of gut health, but also to inspire you to address the mental emotional components that are vital to optimal holistic health. So to educate people about the Earth's microbiome and its connection to gut health, I created the world's first probiotic mocktail. It's in a ready to drink. It has been my mission to provide an alternative to sugar-laden alcoholic beverages that destroy the digestive acids essential to your gut health. After years of laboratory research, we discovered that more than 4% alcohol by volume depletes the body's natural ability to produce these acids that help to assimilate food that we eat. So probiotics are organic fibers and they feed probiotics, which is good bacteria. And then there's hydrochloric acid, AKA gut acid. And we need all of these things to be able to reduce inflammation. HCL breaks down food and helps with absorption and the distribution leading to uh, less inflammation. It serves as a natural antiseptic, killing pathogens as they come into your body. All of this starts in the gut. So stress and aging deplete HCL and these levels of HDL are very important as we age. So every time you drink more than 4% alcohol by volume, you deplete your gut's hydrochloric acid. Also B vitamins that help with nerve health, the liver has to work harder to process this alcohol, and the liver grows sluggish after a while, causing chronic fatigue, skin issues, and what's more, most alcoholic beverages feed candida, pathogenic yeast that compromises immune system, causing a cluster of symptoms that are oftentimes misdiagnosed by Western medical and labeled as autoimmune, thus blaming the patient for their illness and perpetuating the same gaslit scapegoat type of codependent uh, family dynamic that really needs to evolve in our society. So Firm Fatale helps to evolve all of these issues. Listen. I'm not a sober evangelist. Drinking Dirty is about enjoying wildly fermented drinks that are 4% alcohol and under. We don't advocate for staunch sobriety, but we do advocate for gut health. So we need to acknowledge that addiction stems from the addiction to the mind first. So studying death helped me to understand impermanence, which has enlightened 
my mind, I want this type of freedom for you too. The gut has a significant relationship to hormone function and it doesn't stop there. It's, it's all about the thoughts that we think and they actually have a direct connection with how we process things in life. Optimal gut health is about diversity. Alcohol depletes your bioavailable diversity in your gut. So speaking of wild fermentation, let's talk about the ingredients that I use as bases to these probiotic mocktail recipes and why I call them the Dirty Dozen. While representational and inspirational, the recipes in my Dirty Dozen program dip the ladle into multicultural origins where pairing each bevy with what I call a superfood nosh on the side, but they all are about the probiotic mocktail. Though they're not recipes that are 100% alcohol free, these drinks are going to help to thin your blood and allow the vital nutrients to absorb into your blood because they're more bioavailable. They support gut health, which supports overall health. So here are some of the tools and knowledge that you're gonna need to cultivate your own home fermentation station. I like to have either a quart jar or a, a gallon sized glass wide mouth jar, muslin cloth, or some form of breathable uh, mesh, such as so, something to hold it down like a rubber band or twine. You want a designated area you wanna use wooden tools, so you're gonna need a strainer and you're gonna need a funnel. So in addition to these things, some recipes are gonna require live scobies. I like to use flip top bottles for storage and that's pretty much it. So let's get started. First of the dirty dozen is kombucha. Kombucha begins with a strong brew of black, green, or white tea. And it's heavily sweetened with sugar. Don't worry, the sugar's not for you, it's for the ferments. And it's stored in a glass jar and covered with cloth. It's really miraculous. You put the live scoby down in the sweet tea, it begins to eat the sugar, and through its digestive process, naturally occurring compounds are, for, are created. So following the fermentation process, kombucha releases these powerful antioxidants that help to protect your liver and uh, prevent disease. These antioxidants can help reduce inflammation, which may help with chronic disease conditions like heart disease, cancer, even eliminating free radicals in the digestive system. Kombucha supports digestion with high levels of beneficial acids and probiotics. It's also known to improve brain function and uh, help with energy levels because of all of the B vitamins. Kombucha's positive effects on liver function uh, help with diabetes mitigation. Next we have Jun. Jun is known as kombucha's cousin and it's known throughout China and Tibet to be one of the most miraculous live organisms for fermenting tea. But instead of sugar, it feeds off of raw honey, giving it a natural effervescence and the probiotic benefits are shared. Like kombucha, it has a two to 7% alcohol in its brewing and takes about 10 to seven, seven to 10 days. But it, it has a higher probiotic content than kombucha because of the lactobacillus strains. It has two dominant strains of lactobacillus, but has a higher bacteria count than kombucha. So that's the reason why uh, it has more because of the honey. The mystic ethos surrounding Jun's origins are rooted in traditional religious sects, in the Ban Shun religion. And they have very specific brewing practices that mirror the Japanese Koji culture. The tea-based fermented beverages like kombucha and Jun appeared in ancient cultures seemingly spontaneously. And it's no surprise among cultural anthropologists who examine social trends for a deeper understanding of human nature based on a host of influences like geography, climate, and environment, and the degrees in which these factors affect basic human necessities like food, water, and clothing. It's quite miraculous that the natural fermentation of tea-based beverages would flourish around the world at the same time. The spiritual, historical, cultural, and anthropological significance of kombucha and jun 
are rich just as much as their nutritional benefits. So moving on to the next grouping of wildly fermented bases to our dirty mocktails, water and milk kefir. Water kefir is made from the kefir grain that takes the form of crystals. It's an intriguing origin story of its own. Probably propagated on the Mexican prickly pear cacti, water kefir is brought back by Kermenia by the British and offered to Mother Teresa by the Tibetan monks. Crystals also enjoy a symbiotic origin, having appeared in many cultures simultaneously as well, from Mexico, the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Tibet, and Ukraine. So when these crystals are introduced to water and sugar, even molasses or honey during fermentation, it begins to create this carbonated drink. And then you add things like ginger and citrus to the second fermentation, Water kefir enjoys a wide range of names that reflect across cultural regions like Himalayan crystals, California bees, just to name a few. In the same family as water kefir is milk kefir. Also made with, made with this grain, looks like a grain of rice, both in its shape and its size. And then it's added to cow, sheep, uh, or other kinds of milk. Unlike kombucha, which rests in a warm place for days on end, this milk gets capped and agitated to distribute the grains throughout the milk. The kefir strain and the grain is reserved to begin the next batch or padded dry, sometimes even frozen to go into hibernation. The resulting fermented liquid sometimes mimics the flavor of yogurt. The third grouping of dirty mocktail bases is shrub. Obviously, I'm not talking about a bush here. The term shrub refers to the vinegar-based tonic that dates back to biblical times whenever Ruth shared a vinegar drink while working in the fields of Boaz. Adding a batch of fermented fruits or vegetables, shrub was often cured in a jug placed under a shade tree. This vinegar, fruit, or vegetable drink, or shrub, was poured over ice whenever it was available. Thus, shrub became an authentic pre-soda drink. The production of Firm Fatale's probiotic matcha recipe, Shrub Bucha, was inspired by the stories of my grandfather, who was from southern Italy, and he would talk about the, the peasants out in the fields drinking these vinegar-based drinks to cool off in the summer heat. It's refreshing to see these vinegar-based drinks on the rise in the U.S. as consumers are more educated about health, and they're recognizing the merits of vinegar beverages once more. Shrub has been repauperized in the bar scene in the past decade, but there's been a long history of vinegar tonics known as switchels, typically made with water and molasses. And I think the American palate is beginning to understand the value of more astringent foods, which is great. Becoming less addicted to sugar as the gateway drug and it's beginning to help people with deal with their sugar cravings. Did you know that Coca-Cola was actually marketed first as a health tonic? It's this so-called health tonic has contributed to a sick nation. Findings published by the Harvard School of Public Health report in the 1970s, sugary drinks only occupied 4% of average daily calories. By 2001, the amount rose to 11%. In 2008, 91% of American children from ages 6 to 11 were consuming as much as 60% of their daily calories from sugar-sweetened beverages. It's quite alarming. So we live in a culture that adds sugar to everything. Sugar serves as its purpose in the fermentation process. Bees love it. We, however, are not supposed to be ingesting that much sugar. Do you know that the average American ingests six cups of sugar a week? We wonder why so many people are sick and overweight. Sugar suppresses the immune system. It causes mineral deficiencies, accentuates mood disorders, and accelerates the aging process. So remember, when feeding your ferments, the sugar is for them, not for you. Shrub has a sister. Her name is Oxamel, and she's a vinegar and honey-based elixir. Vinegar is as old as civilization and has been found in Egyptian urns dating back to 3000 BC the Babylonian scrolls date back even earlier to around 5,000 BC. It was known as the rich man's wine, Pasca. It was often carried by Roman legionnaires. The Roman soldiers offered it supposedly to Christ at crucifixion. The word oxymel derives from the ancient Egyptian language meaning acid or oxy and honey, mel. 
The practice of brewing salt brine and vinegar to which these fermenters, herbalists, and healers might add honey and herbs was a treatment or a tonic for a variety of ailments. Oxymel's companion remedy was hydromel, which is made with honey and water. Are you beginning to see the collection of dirty drinks are just one big happy community? So whenever I make oxymel, I allow flowers or herbs to rest in raw vinegar and honey for weeks before straining it off. This potent elixir can be served in a probiotic mocktail or just taken by the teaspoon for its healing properties. But vinegar is the common ingredient in oxymel and shrub. Vinegar is derived from sugar containing source with a two-step process. The first stage of fermentation is whenever the sugars get broken down by yeast in the absence of oxygen. And then it goes into a second phase where the addition of oxygen enables bacteria to produce amino acids, waters, and other compounds. So the supporters of wild fermentation would call adding vinegar to your oxymel a shortcut. But in the earliest centuries, nearly every culture had a myth explaining the immortal sweetness of honey. For thousands of years, often found the locations of wild hives were zealously guarded. So the first domesticated beehive may be traced back to the Egyptians who attracted wild swarms to hives fashioned by old logs and tree trunks. We recommend raw honey here at Firm Fatale because it has been unfiltered and it doesn't have a lot of pesticides. If it's been pasteurized, they often times have added sugar to it, so be sure to check your labels. More importantly, get to know your local farmers and beekeepers and ask if they treat those hives with pesticides and ask if they cook their honey down because if they do, uh, it's, it's likely going to weaken your immune system. So when you ingest raw local honey, you're ingesting the pollen from all of the flowers that are being pollinated in the area that you live. This makes a lot more sense than taking a pill uh, for allergies. Again, are you gonna focus on symptoms or are you going to focus on the cause? The endless uses of honey as an essential ingredient in fermentation and meal preparation Notwithstanding, honeybees play a very significant role in pollination of fruits and vegetables. Without the bees, the planet would wither and die. So the fourth dirty base, cider. Though cider may be made from all kinds of fruit, the most common one obviously is apples. Did you know that the species of apples dates back 50 million years? It is believed that the original cider offered by the Celts to Caesar in 55 BC came from Kazakhstan, the original mother of all apples. Its tree graphs were then brought to North America, supposedly by the pilgrims. There's a book called Wild Fermentation, author Sandor Katz, who offers recipes for spontaneous fermentation of hard apple cider crushed with, from apple pulp and it's allowed to ferment in open containers. He says, stir frequently and stir vigorously because the stirring actually oxygenates the, um, the ferment as you stir it. So stirring distributes these airborne yeasts and promotes surface growth. Sandor also shares uh, this, his spontaneous apple cider vinegar recipe. He says that folk medicine of many traditions uses apple cider vinegar as a fortifying tonic. Even Hippocrates, the Greek physician whose oath every American doctor has to swear by, says that vinegar is, was a very specific remedy. Obviously, we think so here at Firm Fatale because we use kombucha vinegar in our recipes. And the same family of cider is Cicer. Cicer comes from fermented apples with water and honey. Often touted as the oldest beverage in the world, Cicer is actually just mead made with apple juice, but it's this unique drink it had, is sweeter and tartar. Thousands of years later, the Druids popularized the apple in Europe and the apple brewing renaissance began, resulting in variety after variety of cider, the main beverage to the people in the late 1800s. So apple orchards were actually a part of how people got paid in their wages 
and Sicer is way beyond apple cider because it requires a lot more skill. The sixth dirty base is called Switchel, another vinegar-based beverage whose popularity rose in the field to the alehouse in the 18th and 19th centuries. Also known as the Haymaker's Punch, the summertime thirst quencher relished by sweaty field hands was served to sailors. With its recipe imported from the rural districts, the universal appeal of Switchel spread to higher social callings. Harvard University students reported to have paraded in the streets with the Cambridge Fire Companies who formed their own militia. Uh, they enjoyed tubs of Switchel on a hot day and even were known to be scre screaming in the streets, Switchel all around. <laughs> So this drink that was uh, fermented with molasses oftentimes would, would be combined with rum. And some of them say that the chambers of Congress were to smash lemons and spices, adding it to the brew. So the beverage was sampled by all in attendance and undoubtedly led to many statesmen pontificating at infidium, perhaps even a filibuster with tremendous verve and swagger. <laughs> <laughs> so number seven of the Dirty Dozen, mead, is the essential ingredient um, of mead, which is fermented honey combined with fruit, yeast, and spices. Even though it was oftentimes called honey wine, it was altogether different. And in Egypt, where honey was highly sought and valued, a god of fertility, Min, was considered the master of wild bees. Manuscript illustrations show that they would have honey parties where they would go and find bees to access the supply. The ancient Egyptians were known to be avid practitioners of fermentation and enthusiastic mead drinkers. A guy named Ken Schramm from Michigan who has a meadery speculates that the origin of mead fermentation is a happenstance discovery in Egypt based on the following premises. Yeast cells were found everywhere in the wild floating in the air and honey hunters went on expeditions to retrieve honey and put them in very specific vessels, which they found later. Number eight of the Dirty Dozen, Tej. Tej is considered mead or honey wine, but it's consumed in East Africa and Ethiopia. Tej is flavored with powdered twigs, leaves, and roots known as geisho and, instead of hops. The brew is vigorously oxygenated to be left to ferment for weeks but it has a higher ABV, so I tend to use a little bit smaller amount of it, but mainly for its health benefits and flavors that arise from the complexity of the geisho and honey. Number nine, kvass. This wonderful drink has a long history in the Russian people. It has been consumed by members of all ranks of society in Russia and Ukraine for years and is widely considered to be safer than water. The people of the North created a lacto-fermented infusion with miraculous health benefits. In addition to quenching one's thirst, kvass has been known to help with hangovers, indigestion, and even help to prevent certain infectious diseases. Traditionally, kvass was made from stale sourdough rye bread. In this drink, it tastes similar to beer, but without the alcohol content. Its health properties are listed but those that have been forced by allergies or immune conditions uh, to eliminate grains and alcohol, kvass is a wonderfully well-known drink uh, available to us. Indeed, Russians have been known to create kvass with all types of ingredients, with raspberries and currants and cherries, but the most common and perhaps the most beneficial, however, is beets, beet kvass. So as with any other fruit or vegetable, the process of lacto-fermentation only increases the natural benefits of beets and the fruits or whatever you decide to use for your kvass. But this traditional method of preservation adds probiotics naturally and allows these nutrients to be absorbed better in your body. Since prolonged cooking often destroys or greatly diminishes the nutritional content of foods, the fact that your beets or fruits remain raw throughout the lacto-fermented process is what gives it such an added advantage. So you can imagine what this little medicinal powerhouse is being turned into as it sits there on your counter, calmly bubbling away in your cupboard. So number 10 is the root bug, one of my favorites. Organic roots, sugar, wild yeast, and water 
are activated in a fermented bug starter. So all you have to do is really feed it. Root bugs are often uh, called warts, and when combined with sugar, water, and naturally occurring yeast, the root, it's, um, on it, the root itself, it begins to create this carbonated effervescent beverage, which is all probiotic. Made from the root of the ginger plant, a ginger bug is simply water, sugar, and ginger with starch to actively uh, ferment just in a couple days. It's called a bug because you have to feed it, but I've done this with turmeric as well. Talk about bioavailability. Its origins date back from colonial spice trade times of the British and Asian cultures, including sugar producing islands of the Caribbean. Its alcohol content was limited to about 2% governed by excess laws in 1855. Ginger beer was popular in Britain and its colonies from the 18th century. Other spices were added and current ginger beers are often brewed frequently with flavor and color additives. So if you want a pro tip, for your root bugs, keep them away from all the other cultures in your house because they can cross pollinate. To keep the bug alive and continue growing, you're gonna need to feed it regularly. Add just one teaspoon of minced ginger to one teaspoon of sugar a day and let it, and, and you'll see that it begins to feed. You can also rest it in the fridge and just feed it one tablespoon of sugar and ginger just once a week. And then to reactivate it, you're gonna bring it back to room temperature and start feeding it again. Number 11 is tapache. We know that tapache was offered by the Aztecs to Herman Cortez, but it's likely been enjoyed by multiple indigenous cultures uh, that are pre-Columbian, also referred to the pre-conquest Central America long before the 16th century. In the native Aztec language, the word tapache actually means to bruise or pound something. Those scholars may suggest that the beverage surfaced in equatorial climates around the world simultaneously. Tapache was initiated from corn originally. In popular culture, it's now made with the peels and the rind of pineapples. Red, orange, in color, tapache is typically sweetened with an unrefined brown sugar and is flavored with spices like cinnamon and star anise. The sweet and sour flavor may be seasoned with lime, salt, and chili. Paired with the rich, spicy tones of traditional Mexican dishes, it's enjoyed in its own merit. The tapache is either non-alcoholic or low alcohol and is oftentimes mixed with mezcal beer or tequila for those that drink alcohol. Last but not least, pulque. Pulque is a beverage made with fermented sap of the agave plant. About six different varieties of mulgue or agave are used for pulque. With the color of milk and the sour yeasty taste with a light foam, this drink and its history go way back to Mesoamerica, extending down into Northern Costa Rica and creating a beautiful mosaic of indigenous colonization of the Americas. Pulque was considered a sacred drink and was served to only certain classes of people, but became secular as the consumption rose. By the 19th century, it had its peak, and then in the 20th century, it was replaced by cerveza. <laughs> so it takes about seven to 14 days to ferment, and if you don't drink it quick enough, it'll spoil. Many superstitions surround pulque, hence the songs, prayers, and rituals that often accompany the traditional fermentation vats called tinnacles, where they would place the sap mixed with a mature seed pulque, which interestingly is a type of bacteria, not yeast. Now that you've been introduced to the Fern Fatale Dirty Dozen and their historical, cultural, and nutritionally acclaimed significance, the possibilities for flavors are endless. One thing that I'm gonna say though, is to always do your best to bring in local, seasonal, and organic whenever possible. Never heat your ferments and keep them raw, wild, and live. The soil is a direct significance to the health of your microbiome, which directly, in my opinion, relates to our ability to evolve consciously. So in regards to probiotic mocktail accoutrements, ingredients are what I call side nosh. 
are gonna help you to draw out the complexity of flavors to these drinks. These can be added, and I enjoy adding them to recipes as side pairings, but also obviously keep them wild and raw as well. So a few that I'm gonna mention are Imboshi, fermented Japanese plums, miso, amba sauce, which is an Indian fermented mango sauce, preserved lemons that are really popular in the Middle East, dried seasonal fruits, lacto-fermented vegetables in their juices, bitters and aperitifs in small quantities, always keeping it under 4% ABV, food grade essential oils, tinctures, herbs, spices, flowers, powdered superfoods like cacao, medicinal mushrooms, and other antioxidant rich foods, fermented foods like black garlic, coffee, chocolate, your possibilities for probiotic mocktails inside Nosh are endless. So in closing, the Firm Fatel slogan, live clean, drink dirty, is a two-sided coin. Just like the trillions of microbiota, parasites, viruses, fungi inside of us and all around us can kill us, can also heal us. As do our thoughts and the deep emotions of the heart, they have the ability to debilitate us and keep us prisoner or set us free. So we're here to have an intimate relationship with the world around us, which involves the process of transformation. Drinking dirty inspires us to celebrate the diversity of life. We're more bacteria cells than we are human cells, but we're also eternal light beings having a human experience. So let's cheers to our oneness.